Genesis. That has been our topic this past three weeks as we study the book of Habakkuk. Uh, not a very popular book, but it's a very insightful book, isn't it? It's a powerful book. It's about life, that crisis happens. And during that time, uh, they were not in, in, a, in a good time. The king is no good, and they're under the threat of the Babylonian um, expansion. And, and actually, during that time, uh, they're being oppressed. They're taxed heavily by the Babylonians. And then the Chaldeans came to attack them. And as they shout out to God, God did not give them what they want. God did not give them what they asked for. And as a matter of fact, after the whole book of Habakkuk is finished, a few years later, they went into exile in Babylon. And that was the story. And that, that was the, 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 the circumstances that they were in. But how many of you can relate to what the Israelites were experiencing at that time. Sometimes things just don't go the way we want them to go. Things just don't go well. And no, it's not of a lack of faith. No, it's not because of, of God's uh, unfaithfulness or anything like that. And that's why the first week we talk about, is, is it okay to wonder? Is it okay to question God? Is it okay to even rant Against God and like, are you there? Are you hello? What's going on? It's not making any sense. And I was telling you the first week of this series. Yes, it is okay. He's a big God. He can handle it. He he much rather have your honest and raw cry rather than uh, you know putting up this pious religious fake uh, front, uh, uh, fake it till you make it type of a thing. It's much better. To just be open and raw with God. Because that means at least you trust him with that much. And then the second week we talk about waiting. Waiting. And back crying out to God. Wondering about God's faithfulness. God answered with something that totally just blew his mind. Didn't want to hear that. But his response. We can really learn from his response. You know what he did? He said, I'm going to stand by the ramparts of the city. I'm going to wait there until he speaks to me. And indeed, God speaks to those who wait upon him. Amen? And he waited. And we learned that we need to wait. And during those waiting, the wait, wait, waiting time is not wasted time. Waiting time is wonderful time of God just doing his work within us. And we have to realize that a lot of times... What he wants in you is not what you want in you. We couldn't care less sometimes. We couldn't care less. Uh, who, I, don't, I don't particularly pray for to have genuine faith. But God is interested that my faith is genuine. I don't care. He cares. And I need to care about what he cares about. That's my journey, my Christian journey. I need to learn to be interested in what God is interested in. About, I told you my story with all the calamities in my life. And, and, uh, and, and I, during those trial times, all I prayed for, all I prayed for was not fa- my faith. I just pray for the resolution. I just want the result. I remember uh, my mother and my mother-in-law died within a week of each other. And I was just all, I was in Kenya. I was, I was going back and forth. And I was like, why? What, what did I do wrong? I was just trying to serve you, being here and there. And uh, uh, you don't know. You never, I don't understand. Until, until right now, I still do not understand. There's a lot of things I do not understand. But there are, there's been things that happened in my life that changed me. And um, the genuineness of my faith according to 1 Peter, was much more precious than gold that perishes. At that time, my prayer was not the faith. My prayer was the gold. Not that I was asking for gold. I was asking for healing for my mother. I was asking for healing for my mother-in-law. That was the goal. Because they're sick, I want them healed. That's, all, that's, all, that's my focus of my prayer. The focus of my prayer. I did not once pray Make me a more faithful person. But God allowed these things to happen in our lives. 
because he wants to build. And, 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 and we, 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 two weeks ago, we talked about why it is so important for us to have this faith. Because he said there's an inheritance up in heaven that cannot spoil or fade that is being kept there for us. But it is kept there by God's mercy and there is an end and our faith. So, yeah, we can lose that if we lose faith. So we need to be interested and concerned about our faith. That's why we, 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 we go through this walk with him too, so that he can strengthen our faith. So that we can have that inheritance that he has prepared for us. Amen. Amen. And as Christians, this is one thing we learn, to keep our mind on things above, not on things below. That's not the object of our faith, that Jesus become our heavenly butler that keeps doing whatever we ask him to do. But instead, we are being transformed into his image. We, our minds are being changed, are being transformed so that we understand the things of God instead of all the things that everybody else are thinking about, right? And because of that understanding, last week, oh... I love uh, Pastor Steffi's preaching last week. How many of you uh, agree with me? Amen. I, I learned so much last week uh, that because of that, we can turn it to worship. And uh, I learned a new word last week, shiganoth, right? It's an it's a, it's a instruction on how to sing those words. And those words are not pretty, any, by the way. It says, when the fig tree does not bear fruit, when the grapevine does, you know, withers, when, when everything goes wrong, basically. But it was the instruction to the musician is, sing it with exceeding exuberance. Like, are you in denial or are you just, what, what are you doing? No, 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 I'm not in denial. We have faith. And I, I cannot help but think about uh, this thing when, when these guys were, were singing here with the way they, they worship the Lord make us look like frozen chosen, you know? I mean, it's like, oh man, you know, I keep looking around and I'm trying to jump and it hurts, you know? <laughs> it's, it's like, man! And then, and, and I know, I, I know the situation in Kampala, I mean, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a lot more difficult here than here. That, but that's why they're so skinny and energetic because you know, they don't have cars, so they walk everywhere. Every day they walk at least 70,000 steps. I'm struggling to get 7,000 steps because I have a car. <laughs> Maybe I should not have a car, then I can be like them and jump around a little more. But, but Shiganoth, in spite of all the situation that, because we have an eternal hope, because we know our inheritance, because we have hope in him, because we trust that he is good, we can sing with exceeding exuberance. Amen. That's the ultimate expression of faith. Hallelujah. And today we're going to close out this, um, this, this series uh, with... Um, yeah, this, this, this is the verse that we end last week with, Habakkuk 3.19. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to tread on the heights. And then for the director of music on my string instruments. Now, the thought that, I, that came to me as, as, as I read, read this is that it's a musical thing, isn't it? I don't know, I don't know if you have experiences, but it, it's very hard to... Do music on your own, just by yourself. These, these, these songs are, are written for a choir with a full-on orchestra. It's, it takes a multitude. And it, it dawned on me this one more thing, because Habakkuk has only three chapters, and this is the fourth week, and this is what I want to talk about. This is best to be lived out together. It's great all those, the first chapter, second chapter, third chapter, we, we study that. It's great. But let me tell you something. After you study the first, second, and third chapter and learn that it's okay to wait, wonder, it, you need to learn to wait, and you need to worship, hey, listen, we, it is best to do all that 
not alone, but together. So the title of this week is Walk Together. How do we walk together? How do you walk with those who are hurting? If you watch Discovery Channel, you know, the, 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 the the caribou herds, or no, no, not caribou, but the, the wildebeest, wildebeest, wildebeest herd in a, near, near their place there in Tanzania, um, uh, the crossing the Mara River, like a million wildebeest every summer crosses, uh, make a, this migration, and all the crocodiles are waiting, and the lions are waiting, because these are like, like, like a parade of in and out, you know, number two. <laughs> Double double is you know double double parading by right so so they're all waiting there and it's always those that are hurting that get separated from the herd that becomes the target. There's strength in numbers. There's strength in togetherness, right? So it is very important for us to understand. If you're hurting, don't leave the herd. <laughs> If you're hurting and you're limping along, find your care group, man. We need to be together. And for all of you that happens to be healthy at this time, hey, let's make a decision to always walk together and be together. Because Galatians chapter 6, verse 2, it says, carry each other's burdens. And in this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. I've seen, I, I love those uh, YouTube uh, animal stuff, you know, the, the baby elephant fall into the ditch. Everybody, the mom, grandma, everybody trying to get them out. How many of you have watched that? And all those uh, animal videos. And um, I don't see, a, I, the, here's one thing I don't see. I don't see a, a baby elephant fall into the ditch and the mom got there and said, I told you not to play there. Maybe later, but right now, the focus is how can we help get you out of this thing, right? Here's the first point. Don't see someone else, someone's pain as an opportunity to preach. Let's not do that. Let's not do that. Also, not only not to preach, but don't give them cheap cliches like, you know, God is great. <laughs> I don't feel great right now. <laughs> or, there. For everything, there is a reason and there's a purpose. Uh, I don't know what my purpose is, but I want to smack your face, you know. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> sometimes I, I you know, I, I'm sinful, I'm a sinful man, but sometimes I feel that way <laughs> when people give me those cheap shots of, uh, I don't know what it's supposed to do. Maybe um, my story of my pain is just too, uh, too much of a hassle for them to listen to. And uh, they want to just minimize and reduce that and uh, trivialize it. At least that's how I feel. Just so that they don't have to be bothered by my story. I don't know. I, I'm not, I don't want to be ranting here. But, but I think sometimes we do that. Sometimes we do that. We just, maybe even with good intention. I'm trying to help someone. By minimizing their pain. I, I don't think that works well, very well at all. Don't see someone's pain as an opportunity to preach. Instead, enter. Enter. This is, this is what the Bible teaches us. Enter into their world. Enter into their pain. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of our compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles. God the, word, God, the word comfort is important to God. Comfort is not always solution. Comfort is not always relief. Comfort is not always removal of pain. No. But God, but God many times chose I'll give you comfort by my presence. And we, we, we're like, it's okay, God. Just, just give me a solution from this. Take this pain out of my life and I'll be okay. But uh, that's sometimes not what God wants to do in our lives. Let me go back to... 
try to enter here. And it's not happening. I said enter and then the system kicks me out. <laughs> okay. Who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. That's why we go through troubles, so that we get comfort from God, so that with that comfort that we got from God, we can comfort others who are enduring trouble and probably bring them closer or into Jesus. That's why we go through troubles. See, Paul begins his second letter to the Corinthians with a word of praise. He praises God the Father for being a God of compassion and comfort. But he then says that God comforts us so that we can comfort one another. And then surprisingly, this comfort comes through the mutual sharing of affliction. The word share is used three times to explain that we experience comfort when we share in each other's suffering. Continuing here, verse 5, for just as we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ, so also our comfort abounds. See, when we share, comfort abounds. Everybody, share, everybody, everybody says share, share. Abounds. abounds. There's connection in those two words. When we share our comfort to someone who is going through trouble, there's an abundance that gets unlocked. As we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ, so also our comfort abounds through Christ. If we are distressed, it is for your comfort and salvation. Have you thought about that? I don't like that ministry. <laughs> Think about this thing for a little bit here. If we are distressed... It is for your comfort and salvation. Have you ever thought that your distress can be a blessing for somebody else? We are so self-centered, aren't we? That when we are distressed, we want everybody just to look at us. But instead, the Bible says, your distress can be a source of comfort and even salvation for others. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort which produces in you patient endurance of the same sufferings we suffer. And our hope for you is firm because we know that just as you share in our sufferings, so also you share in our comfort. Sharing sufferings means sharing comfort. That's why I'm telling you, God wants us to go through this together. We're not called to walk this earth alone. We're called to be together. That's why he formed churches. Not that we should pretend like everything's okay with us and everybody's faking, you know, faking it till, till they make it. As if there's something lacking if you are going through suffering. No. We are to share our sufferings so that we can share in God's comfort. For all of us. Amen. Amen. You, you, gotta, you, gotta, you gotta take this. There is no getting around the fact that a Christian community is a suffering community. The pioneer of our faith, Jesus, he suffered. The main symbol of our tradition is one of agony and death. There's no use to remove the cross from the church, right? The mark of the gospel is not health and wealth, but nails and blood. Amen. It's a community of suffering. The good news is that a Christian community is one that suffers together. That's the good news. So be together. Don't just visit the church. Be the church. Amen. 
We partake in one another's sufferings. <laughs> An unsavory meal made sweeter when eaten together, when we patiently endure with one another. Consolation is not necessarily rescue from suffering, but what comes as we suffer together. So for this reason, we need to learn how to enter into somebody else's pain. When we share in someone else's pain, rather than trying to make it go away, we bring consolation with us. You're not going to magically remove someone's grief when a loved one dies or snap away their depression when the dream fails. The grief and depression are essential parts of that person's healing. The church is a community of people who acknowledges suffering. Jesus offers his presence in suffering. So should we. So if you enter someone's pain, you will bring consolation with you. That's why we, we need to learn to truly empathize. It's no use to throw these cheap cliches. Everything will be okay. Hang in there. God is good. This will pass. Soon you will be glad that this happened. Yeah. <laughs> God is in control. The, God will make you stronger. It's nothing compared to so and so. <laughs> Has anybody done that to you and you want to resort to violence? <laughs> I have. I confess. It's not helpful. We need to learn what it means to really empathize. To empathize. Romans 12 says, rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. That's what the Bible says. Joy calls for joy. Humor calls for laughter. Sadness calls for sadness. If somebody's sad, sit there and learn to be sad with somebody. It's part of life. Part of living this life together as a community of believers. You will not help those that are going through trouble by responding with a detached, logical questions, you know. I learned this uh, we, when, when many years ago when I, uh, when I, when I was be going through training at the Focus on the Family because I was the first director of Focus on the Family Indonesia, you know. And um, we were trained on how to respond to people's uh, letters. They were, they were using letters back then. Uh, <laughs> but they say, like, they, they train us how to gauge a letter in the emotional intensity. For scale 1 to 10. Like, how painful is this letter? How, how raw is this person? Yeah. And, and, and you, we, 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 we're shown many examples of different letters, and we have to rate it. And then they adjust it. So, so we, get, we get it. We understand this is someone who's, right, who's about to take their life. That's a 10 or a 9 and a half. Or, and then after that, we are trained to respond. And the way we respond is if somebody's writing at a 9, you have to write back at a 9. So you set out everything else. You don't, do, you don't do well in between in and out burger, whatever. No, no, no. You sit down, you pray, you write your letter, and you think, God, I'm responding to a nine, and I'm responding with a nine. That's how we were trained at Focus on the Family, responding to people's letters. And I thought, that's empathy. That's important. That pe when people receive the, the, the letter back from Focus on the Family, they know somebody paid attention and somebody's there with them. Rejoice with those who rejoice, mourn with those who mourn. Walk as Jesus walked. John chapter 11, when Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Did you hear that almost accusing tone? Yes. Interestingly, Jesus did not put her at her place. Don't you know I'm the son of God? I know what I'm doing. 
When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, what, what did the Bible say? He was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. This is the Son of God. How many knows that Jesus always knows what he's doing? And yet, he is moved. He is troubled. Where have you laid him, he asked. He didn't have to ask. He knows all things. Come and see, Lord, they replied. And then, here's that verse. Jesus wept. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him? But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man, this man from dying? Now, of course, after that, the miracle did happen. He did raise Lazarus from the dead. He did. Why didn't he just bypass all that and say, hey, look who's coming here. And bam, Lazarus, you it was not the approach that he made. I think he's trying to tell us something. Empathy. Starting with this thing called compassion. Psalm 111 verse 4. He has made his wonderful works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion. That's why he wants us to have compassion too. Because he is full of compassion. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. I want, I, 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 who, who knows when we're going to need mercy? Let's learn to have mercy. Now, let, I'm, I'm going to show you quickly four verses. And I want to I wanna quiz you at the end of this. And I want to ask you if you see any pattern that reveals a truth. All right? Here we go. Mark 1.40. Now a leper came to him, imploring him, kneeling down to him and saying to him, If you are willing, you can make me clean. A leper, right? Then Jesus, moved with compassion, stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I am willing, be cleansed. As soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. Miracle happened. Matthew 15, 32. Now Jesus called his disciples to himself and said, I have compassion on the multitude. Because they have now continued with me three days and have nothing to eat. And I don't want to send them away hungry lest they faint on the way. You know what happened after this, right? The feeding of the 5,000. Great miracle happened. Here's another one. Matthew 20, 31. Then the multitude warned them that they should be quiet. But they cried out all the more saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, Son of David. So Jesus stood still and called them and said, What do you want me to do for you? They said to him, Lord, that our eyes may be open. So Jesus had compassion and touched their eyes. And immediately their eyes received sight and they followed him. A miracle, the blind people received their sight. Luke chapter 7. When the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said to her, Do not weep. Then he came and touched the open coffin. And those who carried him stood still. And he said, young man, I say to you, arise. So he who was dead sat up and began to speak. And he presented him to his mother. Another miracle. A dead man arise. So I, I, I give you four passages all talking about miracles. Did you notice any pattern? What's the similarities between all these? Compassion preceded all the miracles. Now, folks, I think there can be two extremes. After hearing the message of Habakkuk, some people will go to one extreme and say, you know, okay, I'll be stoic. I'll be strong, I'll trust in God, whatever happened, happen, you know. Que sera, sera. What will be, will be, I'll just trust in God. Or on the other side of the extreme, there'll be these people that are in denial. God is good, God is good, God, oh, it's painful. No, 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 it's not painful. No, 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 I'm not sad, I'm glad, and God is good. There can be these two extremes. Those that are in denial, and those that are stoic, and 
passive in their faith? I don't think God wants us to be in either of these extremes. He wants us to be right here, believing in the goodness of God. Right? Not in denial. Suffering together. Yes. Sharing comfort with one another. And yet never lose the faith that He can actually do miracles for us. Amen. Now it's, that's the tension we live in. That's the tension we are called to live in. To never lose hope. Last week, Pastor Steffi also mentioned Romans 8.32. You remember that? If He gave us His Son, how much more He would give us everything that we need. Yeah. Yeah. Mark 11, 24, whatever you pray and ask, you must believe that you have received it and it will be given you. Yes. Don't give up. You got to believe. You got to believe you're going to receive the miracle that you need. But at the same time, no matter what happens, you will stand tall. You're going to wait upon the Lord. You're going to put your trust in Him. And you're going to have compassion with those that are hurting. And we're going to walk together sharing the comfort of God one with another. Amen. That would be a good conclusion for this series, right? And today we learn that compassion precedes the power of God manifested. Do you see that? Every time he was about to make a miracle, the Bible says he was moved with compassion. And I believe as we walk together, folks, as we become a true, caring, loving, genuine community of faith, I believe many, many miracles are about to be revealed in our midst. How many of you need miracles? Don't give up. Stand up right now with me and let's, let's believe. As we share our compassion, as we share our compassion one with another, I believe God will reveal something powerful. Some of you might say, but I'm just not that kind of person. I, I don't know. Compassion is not my strong suit. How do I build compassion in my life? Well, let me, let me tell you the source of compassion. It's called love, the God kind of love, agape. Many of you know that there are three Greek words for love. Agape, phileo, and eros. Now, eros is motivated by feeling. Phileo is motiv motivated by the mind. Agape is a different story. And this will give you hope. Let me tell you just a short story before we close. You know, one day I was in my office and everybody else was not in the office. I think they all went to lunch without me. That's how great my staff is. They went to lunch without me and I was there alone. And then there's a knock on the door. At that time, the office was brand new. I just bought a new couch with my own money, by the way. I like my office clean and then I opened the door I almost didn't open the door but there's a knock on the door and I was looking for my assistant my other pastors nobody's there so I opened the door and there was this very very filthy man very smelly I think his beard stuck to his uh, part you know because of vomit so he was sticking to his very ragged uh, coat. He was very smelly. And he's obviously half drunk, if not three quarters drunk. He said, are you the pastor? And I was so tempted to go, who, who? <laughs> I'm, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm just the janitor or something. <laughs> but Jesus is in this building. <laughs> So I said, yeah, I know where this is going, you know. Yeah, I'm the pastor. <laughs> Can I please tell you a story? I said, you know, I, my job, if 
pastors tell stories. We don't listen to stories, you know. I really don't feel like it. And I was standing there at a crossroads, like, and I was going through this list of love, right? Eros? <laughs> no, n- nowhere near. <laughs> My feeling, uh, I don't feel like talking to him. Then the, the, the filial thing. It's not definitely not my brother, not my relative, not my congregation. Ah, this is just going to be trouble. He's half drunk. I don't think he knows what he, ah, it's, that, there is. No, there is no reason, good reason in my mind to talk to him. Especially I know he's probably going to be puking on my new couch. But then I realized one thing. Well, Eros is not there. Filio is not there. I know the last one is agape. Eros comes from emotion. Filio comes from the mind, calculating mind. But agape comes from the will. Because when Jesus was standing on the balcony of heaven, making a decision whether he's going to come down to earth, knowing full well what we're going to do to him, to a people, going on down to a people that loves darkness more than light. I don't think he has any eros or filial. That was not the motivator for Jesus to come for us. I always think about this during Christmas. What makes him come? It was sheer will in spite of what they're going to do to me in spite of that the fact that they don't even want me I'm still coming down to give my life for them that is agape that is the God kind of love the only love that can drive you to compassion and empathy the only one so I opened the door I said sir please come into my office I almost used somebody else's office, but I had to welcome him into my office. And there he sat. And he started telling the story. He started, he must be like 60 years old. He started his story from when he was eight years old. And I go, oh, Jesus. And he goes on and on and on. And it was incoherent. He he was half drunk. It's incoherent. But there's moments where I can see some flashes of a glimmer of hope. Maybe in his eyes. He told me about how his wife left him. I remember thinking, I would have left him too if I was his wife. And yet, there was a suffering broken man, half drunk. And then somewhere along there, I got so engrossed with this story that I asked him, Brother, you, it sounds like you need help. You need Jesus. And I can remember until today how his eyes widened up. I think he was sober for just a few seconds right there. And he said, I need Jesus. And I, I, I get to pray for him to receive Jesus right there in my room. And after that, his countenance changed. He never once asked me for money. I hugged him. I don't care what it smells. Didn't even cross my mind anymore. Because my eyes were so wet because of the grace of God that flooded my room. It was more precious than a thousand new couches. And he left, never asked me f- for any money. And when I, 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 I realized what just happened, I, I tried to chase him down to give him any money, but he was gone. But he received Jesus. He received Jesus. Listen, folks, we cannot love people with our strength. We're just far too selfish for that. But the love of God is in you. The goodness of God is already in you. 
You may not feel it, but when you receive Christ, He brought with Him all the goodness of God, all the compassion of God, all the mercies of God, all the grace of God. It's already in you. But how do you activate it? Let me tell you, you're never going to feel like it. And if you calculate, calculate it in your mind, most of the time, you will conclude that it was not worth it. But your will, coming from the realization that you have received, now you are being called to freely give. That's what's going to make it happen right here in this community. So it's just your will. Everything else is supplied already by Him. Are you willing? I hope at the end of the Habakkuk series here, we become a loving, empathizing, and compassionate community.